Okay, welcome back. I think we can start our second session. And our first speaker is uh, Professor Martin Fisher. He's a Kumagai professor of engineering at San Stanford University. He's a global leader whose uh, who's, uh, uh, work spans uh, areas in buildings from construction all the way to energy, energy efficiency. He's won a number of, uh, of awards. Uh, the the, the uh, interesting book, uh, um, inter inter integrating project delivery is uh, has been published by uh, Wiley uh, that uh, provides the most modern methods in uh, 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 project management. Um, is a member of the of the uh, National Academy of Construction in the United States and the Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences in Sweden. And so I'll uh, I'll uh, have Martin please take over and. Uh, share the screen. Thank you, Igor, and everyone uh, at UCSB for organizing this event. Um, very much enjoyed it so far. And uh, I sure, I'm sure I will uh, the rest as well. And I am also looking forward to uh, being, um, seeing your building, as you said, in, as we prepare for today. Um, so I, as I was uh, thinking about uh, the workshop, I, decided to take a bit more of a sort of management and design perspective and uh, ended up generating more questions than I have answers. So uh, hopefully that's okay. Uh, I know you said we should send you some questions. Um, they will be coming throughout the presentation and we can see if we want to pick up any of them up during the, uh, the discussion afterwards. Um, so I do, um, my work at Stanford, uh, largely in the context um, of SIFI, the Center for Integrated Facility Engineering, where we really look at uh, how can we digitalize and integrate the different phases, the perspectives of the different disciplines, the different systems that we have in a building and in a number of buildings, neighborhoods, and so on. And so across different scales. Um, and for that, this network of uh, building owners, um, engineering, construction companies, and uh, technology providers is uh, very helpful. So just to give you a little background. And as you said, uh, the questions we address um, really span design, construction, building operation, um, the feedback loops, really broadly speaking, um, how I characterize our work is, um, you're here today making a decision that relates to a building or infrastructure system. And you should be able to do that by understanding the history better and by understanding the possible futures better. And so we work basically, broadly speaking, at three areas here. How do we understand the performance that we have achieved in the past better and what were drivers of that performance? how can we simulate uh, possible futures and create at least a base on what we know today an optimal design and uh, how do we manage that um, really much more data and tool intensive uh, set of methods um, companies here don't have really a method of managing um, working in the context of the built environment with these uh, emerging methods so broadly speaking, that's what we work on. And of course, building energy efficiency is um, absolutely a critical element of that. And this has been brought up many times, but this is, um, as I reflect back uh, even 10 years or so, um, this is what I've seen as a new thing that we can finally understand demand and supply. Um, I would say up to 10 years ago, the majority of people uh worked on one or the other side of things and they didn't really meet but um, i think thanks to the availability of uh, data analysis methods we can start to think about how do we manage and meet and make demand and supply meet um, and that has already been a, an important topic of the conversation so far in our workshop the other thing that's uh, really new as i reflect back to uh, workshop I participated a few years back when you invited me, uh, Igor, um, that we really, I mean, have a whole set of tools, each one of them um, exciting and really quite amazing 
on their own, but uh, collectively, uh, some days I wake up and I wake up with sort of a headache and think how all of these um, sets of tools, methods, emerging technologies going to interact and what kind of future are they creating for us? And how do we shape the future that we wanna have? Um, but it's of course uh, terribly exciting what these allow us as uh, people, these tools, these methods allow us as people to do. And so that's something that I reflect on a lot as well. And again, this has also been brought up so far. So as mentioned, um, we should be able fairly soon, hopefully, um, design our buildings for the performance we really want. And I'll come back to that, what that actually means. Um, so I envision that um, a group of people designing different disciplines, um, I would still think our, we would be uh, in the driver's seat there, but we can also talk about that, um, that we, um, a group of people, experts, uh, would design a building or a set of buildings um, with data-driven methods by understanding, figuring out what performances they actually like from the past that exists uh, to then um, look, see what performances might be possible in the particular situation uh, where that, uh, say, if this is a building is uh, located um, in its socioeconomic uh, context, geographic context, to then end up with uh, the building that has the performance we want in the future. And to do so quickly and uh, creatively and reliably. I think that's the vision we have. Um, and uh, I think you know that uh, we can kind of imagine that uh, we could get there, but there is many, many um, issues we have to solve. And I will touch on some of them. Um, and I know many here in the workshop are aware of probably many others. But just to set the stage of what I, how I see us working in the future, uh, or how I see us beginning to work, um, I wanted to put this slide here right up front and also love to get some feedback whether this is the right way to think about this or we should approach this problem in another way. But uh, moving forward with this perspective, that then begs the question, well, what performance do we want? Um, so we need a language to talk about this performance. And then, of course, we need data. We need to make, we need to make predictions and measurements. And I'll touch on those. And again, this has been touched on already. Uh, it's um, an issue that will stay with us for, I think, for some time. Then um, in terms of design, what do we need to design? And we have heard um, approaches to design the demand. We have both heard um, approaches to design the supply already. Um, we certainly need to design the particular systems in a building or in an energy system, buildings, neighborhood cities, yeah, um, energy systems, or the user experiences. I think we need to design all of these aspects. And I believe we are really just at the beginning for some of those. And then uh, we've seen in the last two years, uh, what happens if the world changes? So I have uh, I run a report on a research uh, project that um, one of my postdocs did in terms of uh, studying the effect of the pandemic on the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. And uh, we also need to bring the knowledge we're creating to the next generation. And I wanna share an initiative we started on building, teaching building energy efficiency. And then the discussion, hopefully we can then build on that and uh, um, see where we go next, as uh, was mentioned in the beginning of the workshop. So in terms of a language for, um, high per for performance of buildings, we propose uh, such a language in the in this book that you mentioned, Igor, uh, that, um, well, we believe is the way to manage projects these days in a more, with a more integrated approach. I also love to get some feedback on that. But uh, we, we organize this language into the four major stakeholders that we see in buildings. So first and foremost, the users. Um, for me, that's really the most important, not that the others are not important, but it's the most important because that's the purpose of the building. And of course they care about the health and safety functionality, daylight access, comfort, aesthetics, acoustics. So it's categories like these uh, for which we should have performance data and performance targets. 
then you can't, you will not have a building unless it is buildable. And here we have the classic um, project management objectives for building, safety, schedule, cost, quality. It's also the operators in especially larger buildings. Of course, in a home, user operators tend to be the same. But in a larger building, um, we have operators. And of course, they care typically about safety, energy, water, building operations, maintenance. So we also need to have um, performance data and predictions here. And then um, what I would, maybe I should change this to sort of the neighborhood, the, the, the wider context, the, um, sustainability, basically. How is this is a building enhancing or taking away from the economic, uh, social, and uh, environmental um, performance of a whole area, for example. So those we see as the, the main stakeholders. And um, for us, as we were working on the book, it was uh, kind of sobering to write it down and realize just how many things somebody that manages a building, a campus, a city, really should be thinking about. And uh, so I wanted to offer um, this slide here as a way for us to put energy efficiency into a larger context of what um, yeah, somebody, as I mentioned, has to manage a building, really has to manage. One thing that has um, surprised me, I want to offer another framework, um, but it has actually surprised me uh, because I haven't seen a situation where we have actually all of this data but as we as you again think about uh, what we need to predict what we need to measure what we need to manage um, we need to of course manage the um, commercial energy co2 human uh, performance related to our buildings and uh, for that we need to pay attention to design and construction costs and design and construction duration we need to pay attention to the facility maintenance cost, building operations cost, and the business operations cost. And we need to, of course, pay attention to um, the income or from a facility or the value and how long um, a facility is lasting. That is driven sometimes by um, actually really the durability of the facility, but also sometimes by the durability or longevity of a particular business purpose for a facility in the market. And um, I'll try to indicate what we sort of typically try to optimize, right? We try to minimize design construction costs. We try to minimize design construction duration. We try to um, minimize the business building and facility uh, costs. And we try to maximize the income and extend the duration typically. and. But what I, what I mentioned, um, what I'm surprised by is that it seems like a very obvious framework for us to think about um, the desi um, design and the different phases of a project, but also then the different cost impact in not only money, uh, but other terms as well. But I have not found a single building where we actually have these data, even from building operators. Um, and if you so, if if I just have been barking up the wrong trees, then that would be fantastic to learn. If you um, have case studies, uh, because unless we have these data, right? How can we make the trade-offs that we need to typically make in design as we uh, look out, as we really shape the performance of a building or a set of buildings over their use span? And, and so, unless we have these data and the methods for measurement and prediction, then how can we uh, really inform the trade-offs um, that the people right, that I showed at the beginning have to make? And so a few, um, um, just a few topics related to this um, are what performance metrics do we really pay attention to and um, how good are our prediction methods? Uh, how well do we understand actually user buildings? There's many more, uh, but those are, these are a few that uh, I or some of my researchers or some of my colleagues or collaborators have, have looked at. This, as you can see from the numbers, is, is a bit old, but I think it's still a relevant example to make this point quickly. Um, these are buildings, uh, retail buildings at various uh, Disneylands around the world. 
And uh, they were wondering which building operator should get a Christmas bonus. And uh, if you look at a building on Hong Kong Disneyland on the left in blue and Walt Disney World in Orlando in, in green, um, both the same kind of retail building, you can see that on a square meter, kilowatt hour per year per square meter basis, the, um, well, the bonus should go to the building operator in Orlando is far more efficient. But then when you look at the same buildings on a kilowatt hour per square meter per transaction basis, which connects to the purpose of the building, you see that the um, building operator in Hong Kong is performing much better. Um, so this, uh, this still makes me wonder, and I still have not found um, sort of value or purpose focused metrics for built environment that are used widely uh, more commonly. And, and again, if I'm uh, misinformed here, I have been working with the wrong people, let me know. Uh, but we still find largely um, these cost based metrics, kilowatt hour per square meter. Both of those are cost um, related to the cost of the building. It costs money to build the square meters and it costs money to get the kilowatts. Um, but here, right, the purpose of this particular building is to sell things. So the transaction is relates much more closely to what the building is supposed to do. And um, so what I, I think uh, is still the case, um, and I'd love to be corrected, as I said, um, that we tend to use mostly cost-focused metrics for building energy efficiency, and that we uh, tend to focus on just one often, um, or just very few metrics, which then invites, of course, the gaming of the system. People are extremely good at that. They will figure out how to game a single, fo single metric focused system very easily. Um, so I, I would really like to think about how can we bring more value or purpose driven metrics um, into the building energy uh, efficiency conversation. Uh, the other topic I mentioned is the um, performance predictions. I think this is probably well known. Although again, if you have uh, better news here, then uh, I'd love to stand corrected. But uh, a few years ago, we were able to work with a major owner operator who really cared uh, to see how um, well their simulations, um, initial simulations, and then uh, um, simulations that are based on building operations data actually perform. And you can see that for some buildings like six, seven, eight, um, the predictions are pretty good related relative to the actual cost, um, which is the uh, red bars, but in others way off. Um, and this seems to, this has been reported in literature as well as I'm sure you know probably better than I do actually. Um, but it's still, um, I think a very, very critical issue. This um, um, not out of the box fidelity of building energy performance predictions. Because if we cannot make accurate predictions rapidly, consistently, that um, of is then too high an uncertainty, for example, to finance a particular energy efficiency retrofits, et cetera. Um, so I think this is a really uh, critical point because we allocate all resources on the basis of our predictions. And so we, we need to find a way to make them better. And hopefully some of you have, uh, have seen better methods here. Um, I mean, we, we looked into where, why is there the discrepancy? It, it's really it comes from, from everywhere, from the accuracy of the uh, data about the building to, of course, the uh, assumptions in building operation and the nonlinearity of, of, of a building, um, of, of its energy performance, and so on. Uh, the other thing we're trying to understand is the building occupancy. That is, at least in the North American context, of course, uh, very heavily related to um, privacy issues. And so this is work by um, Andrew Santa, my colleagues Andrew Santa and Rishi Jane. Um, Rishi at Stanford and Andrew about, I think, to be at APFL in Switzerland. And they developed a method to understand how an office building is being used from plug load data, which is a chance we can get. 
and uh, they um, and so what they found is actually that uh, they can infer pretty well um, from looking at the plug loads and how they are changing over time. Um, who might be, how many of the people might actually be hanging out together? I mean, it's not certain, etc. But we were able to get a ground truth in uh, some buildings where we were able to observe what was really going on and then correlate that with the plug load. Um, so it looks like a very promising method to study the plug load at each uh, desk um, and realize, okay, this person is sitting at a desk or this person is not at the desk, and then correlate that with um, the plug loads of other users and uh, possibly think about um, once we have this data whether uh, there could be an optimization in the layout of the building in terms of where people sit and uh, this is a bit yeah a bit of a conjecture but uh, according to the simulations they did they saw a five to six percent improvement uh, potential from a better layout for the particular case study so I think this is uh, another important question is how the buildings actually used, right? If we want to get to a value-based metric and um, again, it would be good to discuss um, how we get these data and what are other methods for getting these insights. And then the, the other part that uh, we work on quite a lot in many areas is um, sort of self-managing or autonomous uh, buildings. That's not only on the building side, it's also in construction in many, many areas. And I'm wondering how far out this um, idea of self-managing buildings, uh, Igor mentioned it, really is. Um, as we looked into this, and it's a little bit too detailed probably to go through here, um, but um, looking at how we uh, process data, uh, generate a digital twin, um, develop an optimization strategy, uh, analyze building performance, visualize results, um, we see quite many areas where we have to make significant improvement in terms of uh, um, understanding data quality, uh, for example, um, validating a digital twin and connecting it automatically with data feeds, um, agreeing on the uh, well performance that should be analyzed, um, back to the previous uh, discussion I had um and then yeah and who needs to see the results who 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 intervenes when and so on um if if somebody needs to still intervene but i think this is um for me it's for us it has been a, a really good way of um showing or understanding where are we in all of these areas with the current methods um, by trying to automate uh, the operation of a building fully, um, it forces us to be really clear on, um, on these and probably more uh, issues. And that has been a, a very useful research method for us. Um, but I'd like to actually discuss, you know, do we really want to have self-managing buildings? Why, why not? I mean, it seems kind of like you would want to, but maybe you should think about that a bit more. And how close, how far are we to actually having them? So I've already alluded to these uh, discussion questions. Um, are there value-focused metrics that are commonly used? If not, how could we bring such metrics to practice? Um, is there an organization or case study that has data for all of the parts of the obvious, I think, cost-value framework that I showed? And the uh, question about self-managing buildings. So I know this is a lot of topics, um, and obviously we, we will see where we want to take it in the uh, conversation. So I want to quickly share a couple other efforts that the recent efforts that uh, have happened. Uh, one is a study that Natasha Mrazovic, one of my postdocs, has done uh, in the pandemic uh, as she was in at home lockdown. She said, "Okay, I have lots of time to look at things, and I'm just really curious to see." to study how uh, people in, uh, in webinars, in reports, in, in all kinds of publications, uh, talk about the effect of the pandemic on the architecture, engineering, construction industry. And so 
I don't really still not quite sure how she did that, but in some months she looked at up to 900 references in terms of yeah, different publications related to impact mm. of the pandemic. Um, eventually categorized, developed 12 categories and 22 subcategories with building operations being one of the 12 categories. Others were right impact on construction and so on. So um, there is a report published on this uh, on our website, uh, but I, I asked her to pull out sort of the a bit over time what she saw as the major trends um, in all of those uh, references and sources uh, related to building operations and energy efficiency. So what she found in early in the uh, pandemic, um, this was only going to be a month and uh, we didn't really have to do too many changes, um, although health and safety priorities were starting to emerge. And so we needed to have these develop these procedures, not, not surprising. Um, then, um, as we realized this was here to stay for a little bit longer, um, what um, was reported as that, um, what she found is that people reported that buildings are using more energy than pre-pandemic, even though they were not actually hardly being used. And uh, basically this uh, health and safety issue, there's a quote from one of the uh, uh, sources, energy efficiency was the topic to discuss before the pandemic. But now we are we're using more energy to make buildings as safe as possible. So energy efficiency was like an afterthought. We made operational changes that consume more energy than before. All our assets are open nonstop, though in some only essential workers are working. Ideally in a year or so, we will go back to what was before the pandemic. Again, it's interesting to look back and see the sort of predictions um, at the time, but I think this is helpful for us to think about too, as we, as we think about what do we want to do in the future. And uh, so the reflection now is um, that uh, before COVID, we really paid attention at what we saw on energy efficiency, um, using less energy. Um, but now that gets balanced with the health and safety. Um, and um, so I'm curious how you experience that um, in terms of your building performance or, the, or the, those of your clients or that your research. And um, yeah, I think the other topics uh, previous speakers have already mentioned or have already been alluded to in terms of uh, technology. Um, the um, challenge of managing buildings, how do we create the knowledge um, for our facility managers? Um, and um, I think people are struggling. What we see is people are trying to figure out what is really sort of the normal future operation. So I'm curious how our findings that basically based on what has been, what was discussed in the literature and in, in the industrial professional literature, um, how do those compare with your experiences and what should we actually take away in terms of this disruption we had? I think it, it made us rethink our assumptions. Um, at least that was a very useful insight for us. And then, um, I want to sort of share one last um, example of a recent work we have been doing um, focused on the education, uh, the Stanford Building Decarbonization Learning Accelerator. It's kind of a mouthful, BDLA. Um, but um, I'll try to quickly motivate it and share where we are. And then curious to see whether you think this is indeed a good effort, a uh, good way of spending our time um, and if so, whether you would like to support it. Um, I was really mostly led by Peter Ramsey and his colleague Avril, and I'm uh, the main guy at Stanford. And uh, But quite a few others have supported us um, in this effort. Um, I've mostly worked with Nea Malou um, at Harvard University. I'll come back to that. But as you know, um, now, um, most of the new electricity sources are from renewable sources, um, which then enables a rapid decarbonization. But um, what we see, AEC architects, engineers, and such professionals at scale are rather slow to adapt. So how do we educate them so that they can uh, produce decarbonized buildings? I mean, we saw this and a student of mine did a, a case study over the autumn quarter 
with uh, several developers who are very successful, uh, well-meaning. And he said, basically, he was shocked that energy efficiency gets discussed, but at the end of the day, it doesn't quite uh, really make it to the forefront. Uh, other other topics, other performance aspects, uh, trumpet. Um, so that's why the language that I suggested at the beginning, I think, is important. Um, reflection that Peter had is um, that, um, based on, on his um, analysis, the average American um, is sort of responsible for about 1.2 thousand metric tons of CO2. But the building designer over his or her career affects, you know, 1.15 million metric tons through the decisions they're making. So I think that was uh, quite a, for me, really interesting way to look at this. And uh, sorry if I'm late to the party here, um, just the impact that right, building designers have, hence the title of my presentation. And then hence the importance of uh, trying to educate um, a few students to then hopefully affect the professionals when they go into those practices. So the goal of our BDLA effort is um, to really uh, help other faculty members bring learnings about uh, building decarbonization and strategies for building decarbonization to their students so that as part of uh, getting um, these methods into practice. The initial focus is on um, working with faculty at HBCUs um, because um, they, the HBCUs are in areas where there is still a lot of um, fossil fuel being used. Um, so trying to get um, them into practice and bringing those methods into practice, I think is, is, is critical also from a social justice perspective. Um, and so we have uh, mostly worked um, with these universities, actually mostly with Howard University, with Nia Malu, where we um, helped uh, deliver what we believe is the first architecture course that was fully dedicated to building decarbonization last summer. Um, so what is this uh, BDLA? Um, basically uh, providing teaching resources for college university professors in architecture, engineering, and construction management. Um, in terms of presentations, case studies, videos, assignments, and, and support. So um, it's accessible through our website um, and with, in terms of access to slide decks and so on, and also in terms of uh, case studies. Um, one of the main case studies was the AIA headquarter renovation, or is the AIA headquarter renovation. I think that's well well known effort. Um, I think there's maybe a little bit here in the, too much in the weeds, but uh, where we have uh, materials now, and uh, um, obviously we need a lot more. So I'm wondering, um, is that decarbonization of buildings we need to focus that makes energy efficiency widespread? Is that finally sort of the word that will get us there? I'm curious what you think. Um, this initiative, do you like it? Should we keep uh, doing it? Is this a good way, as I said, to spend our resources? And if so, uh, is there a way for you to support it? with the case study, money, whatever uh, makes sense in your case. So um, yeah, this is one of the recent efforts we're doing related to energy efficiency. So broadly, overall, um, the question that I have been reflecting on is which sustainability solutions are globally scalable rapidly? Um, this sort of came to me, although made, I started to think about this in, the context of a couple recent conferences. In one, um, methods for retrofitting homes for greater energy efficiency um, were produced in, in the UK particularly. And uh, then I calculated to reach the targets we need to, I think we have something like three minutes uh, to retrofit every home. So it doesn't appear to be rapidly scalable. So something is missing still. In the other was a presentation by a um, major uh, developer of uh, multifamily housing projects. And uh, they pointed out that um, there, there was, the building was done in, in timber and that was already alluded to as well. And they pointed out that it took the North American forest only eight minutes to grow the timber for that building. 
And then so I also then back at the envelope calculation showed me that 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 was really useful information because we could then calculate the colleague and I might then calculated that uh, okay current timber supply could be used to build a third of the buildings in North America. So many more than we do today, but certainly not actually scalable. Well, because that would also mean we stopped making furniture out of timber and things like that. Uh, so that obviously not quite feasible, but anyway, I'm just curious what was the limit at the moment. Um, so um, yeah, these sort of examples show, so we see a lot of hype and opportunity uh, with yeah, better solutions, but then, um, when we try to see how they actually scale, are they rapidly scalable? More often than not, I find no. Uh, but this is just sort of initial reflections. Um, but this is a topic that I think would be very useful for us to think about. Um, which are the sustainability solutions um, that we have could really be scaled globally rapidly? Do we have the resources? Do we have the skills? Do we have the, the way to disseminate the knowledge, et cetera? So um, as I mentioned, uh, lots of questions for my presentation, but hopefully the glimpse in our current work and um, issues we try to deal with, and then the questions are helpful for the workshop. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, speaker. Um, thanks, thanks for that very wide ranging um, discussion that uh, that emphasizes how much of the energy efficiency questions are actually tied to many, many other questions, mm -hmm. including including the ones you know that that happen at the design stage. Um, it, we have a lot, plenty of time for discussion, so we, we do have a few minutes for questions. If uh, if anybody would like to ask um, right now, either panelists or participants. I'll, let me see. I'll, I'll start with a brief one. On your graph of uh, you know predicted versus um, versus mm -hmm. performance, uh, that was prediction based on the design um, uh, the design calculations, right? The energy. So the, yeah. So there was the one, two. One was uh, basically the, the initial design. Uh, those tended to be even worse. And then we uh, another one we made a bit later. Um, where we had better data about the operation of the building. And so it seems like the situation, since I last looked at the problem, it seems that the situation didn't, didn't change that much. I mean, you pointed this interesting work on, me on uh, measuring occupancy from plug loads. And uh, in some work that we have done, it, it really does turn out that one of the major issues that is missed or changed really, so it's not really the fault of predictors, uh, is, is the usage. The, the mm -hmm. occupancy changes. And mm -hmm. it's very similar to that point that Marianne did, which is, mm -hmm. look, you know, you retrofit, you change the use of the building and the predictions that you had from, a, from, a, from an upfront, uh, up, upfront piece of software uh, are just out, out the window. So, so that's, you know, monitoring, I think, Keyword monitoring, I would say, is yep. is is really something that we need to uh, enhance. On and Marianne had a question. Yeah, Martin, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, it's a good compliment to the one I gave um, because I was talking a little bit more about the grid and, and controls and and thinking about design is really important. Uh, I I keep in touch with Peter Rumsey. He's actually uh, lives a block and a half from me, so I see him. And we chat and great, great work you're doing with him. Uh, my question's about carbon metrics in the building sector. And you know, you you showed you talked about design costs and operational costs. And um, getting think people to think about carbon is a really different thing, uh, whether it's the embodied carbon or the operational carbon. Mm -hmm. How do you think, how do you think we get the buildings community? interested in that issue and if we wanted a carbon benchmark um do you think aia is interested how, how do you think about sort of the decarbonization pathways and helping the architects and engineers and facility managers get involved no i see 
um, a lot more attention to this term, so it seems to stick more. I have to admit, decarbonization is not totally my favorite term um, because um, we wouldn't have a building without carbon, uh, obviously. So it's a bit a strange term, but I understand we're talking about the fugitive carbon as uh, Bill McDonough talks. Um, but it is a, it has, um, my experience, it has been, um, it has been sticking more. And so I think in that sense, I do see a possibility and, and the people do understand, as you said, the embodied carbon and the, um, operational carbon. Um, I think that's uh, still a uh, level where people people get it. And it seems like this could be an, an easier approach, as you said, the benchmark, because um, we could, um, I, yeah, energy efficiency was always, um, at least I found in, um, I, the people's eyes glaze over too quickly you know um not that they wouldn't want to be efficient but uh yeah when you get into a design meeting and and there's the multiple disciplines there and they try to juggle these these many performance aspects uh it becomes it becomes difficult and, and the project teams i mean when you visit the building i'm in i think as an example we had great aspirations and i think it's overall working quite well, but it took a lot of effort to make it work well. So it's not really scalable. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, but the embodied carbon, operational carbon, I think are numbers that uh, could possibly socialize, but I think it would take a combination of uh, ASHRAE, AIA, but then also we have to, maybe that's where now that I think about it, um, AGC, you know, the builders have to be on board too, because I think my reflection is that's where things fell apart in our building, because people have, um, project teams have a, like, if you come and propose something that has a chance of the building falling down, you know, as a change, they will react and say, no, no you're crazy. We're not going to do that. We have learned that but we don't have the same reflection when it comes to energy efficiency um, or decarbonization methods. We make cost-cutting methods. We, we make cost-cutting changes. Um, we think, yeah, that's okay. But before we know it, we made the building much worse. And if you don't like the term decarbonization, is there another term that you think that you like better? No, uh, yeah, so that's why I keep using it also, right? And that's why I'm part of the decarbonization effort. No, I, I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's. Um, the train has left the station. I don't think we can change it anymore. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that, yeah. Okay. One hundred percent happy, but uh, yeah. I mean, what do you think about that term? Well, uh, I agree. So, you know, I'll tell you some of the leadership at the Department of Energy um, is like, we don't do energy efficiency anymore. We do decarbonization. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, there's so many reasons why energy efficiency matters. It's because, you know, carbon is not linked to bills. That's the hard thing, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not necessarily economic. And so how, um, how to, how to think about Helping people understand, you know, if you think about the climate agenda, it is urgent. And so I think mm -hmm. we need to try a lot of things. I think that's that's the thing is, I think that, again, the people on this call have an opportunity to really try to amplify these messages and, mm -hmm. and accelerate the innovation because it's, it's pretty darn urgent. Yes. Yeah. So we try everything. And... Tim had a great point, which is humans are also carbon based, so their carbonization <laughs> might not be <laughs> might not be the best thing, best term. Uh, I, I had Dan and Mark uh, literally at the same time. I think uh, I'll, I'll ask you to agree on who wants to go first. <laughs> go ahead, Mark. Thanks, Dan. This is quick. Um, are there you, you kind of a lot of your perspective was sort of the U.S. and there's to some extent occasionally in Europe. And mm -hmm. I just wondered, you know, and again, I'm, I'm not, I'm a computer scientist. I'm from another part of the world here, another part of the 
the technical world. How much of what you talked about is applicable in places, as John mentioned, like China and India, you know, the developing world and, and, and you know, uh, Um, yeah, I think that's partly, uh, I mean, it's partly applicable, partly not. We are, I'm mostly coming from there, and I think that's um, Marianne's uh, point as well. Uh, it's, it's urgent um, to bring, to, to identify the particularly bad practices and make sure that they don't get implemented in places like China, India, uh, Africa, where right, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of buildings are being built. Um, but then um, others have done, uh, I remember, uh, I don't know whether it was a, oh, it was, I think, a, a conference at, at Stanford a few years ago. We had a, a research from China, and others here may be more up to speed on that uh, and up to date. Um, but uh, basically, he pointed out actually, uh, in the Chinese building is more multifamily housing project was more energy dramatically more energy efficient uh, than because of the lower income of the people largely um, than um, than the uh, U.S. because they would just air condition a room. The rest of the building was quite warm, and uh, in the U.S. you just air condition the entire building. But as uh, China became more affluent, now we start into air conditioning in that building also. So that's where so this is like an example of um, where, where we see uh, yeah, this trade-off between overall comfort and ease of operation uh, in some way, um, distribution of, of that operation with um, then energy efficiency. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, those are some great points. There are fan coils in every room, and uh, things are very efficient. Uh, then, and then yeah, we, so have, we have a question then from uh, from uh, one of the attendees. But then first, yeah. So there has been a multi million, arguably multi tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars business in over the last twenty some odd years, or maybe twenty years uh, in carbon corporate carbon mitigation efforts as part of corporate social responsibility plans okay and you get the report from the multi-billion dollar international corporation about all the stuff that they're doing to mitigate carbon and how they're limiting business travel and you've got scope one scope two and scope three emissions and all that kind of stuff. And arguably, having participated in a number of these things over the years, the approach to the built environment is typically very superficial and very naive, mm -hmm. uh, not very te technically good. And uh, so, um, you know, there, I think there is room uh, to make that better and try to, um, uh, to try to continue to tag along with this, uh, you know, arguably public relations motivated uh, uh, sort of trend of large businesses. If we can, if we can sort of inject ourselves into this process with good technical input, there is the opportunity to achieve something, I think. Yep. No, thanks. I totally agree. Uh, it's a much better articulation of the point I made before in terms of I see that this um, decarbonization is taking, and I think this is one of the one of the reasons, at least for the time being. Yeah. No, I totally agree, Daniel. Maybe the last one is uh, a question from Andrew in in, in the audience. Uh, is there documentation about increase of first costs, uh, D and C? for building performance versus life cycle costs? And is there work to show and educate developers and large portfolio owners operators about business case to justify first cost premium for high performance? So this is comes up. So in, in, in all the companies I, I have a pleasure to work with that uh, make buildings, 
this comes up all the time and at least i have not seen such a study I, i've seen many many of anecdotes you know people saying this is two percent more or five percent more or no if you really pay attention it's actually not more um this is the anecdotes i've heard um or seen um uh, but then uh, um and and this is a good point i think if we can uh, get to if we could really show this conclusively we could influence um the development of buildings much more and this carves back to one of the salient points that that you made uh, nicely and strongly and that is that reduction of risk for investment in energy efficiency mm -hmm. yep. is Perfect. is a blockage that precisely those kinds of studies could unblock. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's really a very, very serious problem. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, that harms back to some of the some of the technical aspects that are pretty deep, mm -hmm. because those kinds of um, um, verifications, validations, monitoring. They're not exactly easy to do, and you mentioned that when you when you compared, you know, who should get the Christmas bonus. So, what exactly is the metric? And so now, now we're getting to fundamentals, which is kind of which is which is kind of interesting. Um, and Tim, uh, because you're the next speaker, but also you're asking, you're uh, you're noting something, so maybe you can you can tell us, and then I'll I'll have the pleasure of introducing you next. But thanks, just... thanks Martin, again. I'm just running over my own time now, so <laughs> it's okay. We've we put plenty of time in the discussion, so I've uh, okay. we've allowed a, you know a little bit more time for basically the first part part of the discussion. You have all of your time uh, mm -hmm. in the present in the presentation that that you want. Here. If, if I can Thank just you. very quickly comment, sorry, uh, Tim. Uh, I, I really like this uh, summary that uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, Igor. Um, and and this is what actually does excite me about. Uh, being here today and 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 and, and working on this uh, um, today is um, I finally see really this connection between the technical, the the conceptual underpinnings and the the really the global impact and business value, and I think the and that's where I think the technologies do make a difference. In our ability to get the data to validate our our assumptions, our methods, and then connect them to this problem of like taking out the risk for energy efficiency investment, for example. And that's Tim's point yes. in a certain case. Just a note around lack of standardization around GAG accounting, right? Hard to compare. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Speaking. I mean, the, I think I'm just repeating what others had already said, um, but. There are big claims out there in terms of meeting these net zero targets and um, around decarbonization, but all the the methodologies are non-standardized. People are using different approaches to to make these accounting um, calculations. So it, we really need to do some work, I think, around standardizing these methodologies so that we can compare on a more even platform what people are doing. And uh, a final thing, because it's from the attendee, uh, uh, Scott said, how about funding a consumer reports type organization that review energy and carbon metrics in buildings? Data gathering will be time consuming, maybe awards for some. It's an interesting idea. So uh, maybe let's leave it there and, and discuss it a little bit later because it's, it's a broader point, but a, a very nice point. 